Check one, two. All right. Good morning and welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. Happy Easter to everyone and to all of, uh, all of you visitors, uh, a special welcome. Please stand and let's sing together. Precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell. calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand no power of hell no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand here in the Happy Easter and good morning. Welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. My name is Brown Peterson, and I will be leading us in parts of our worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from Acts 2. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him 
in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You may be seated. Will you join me in our prayer of adoration and confession? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is no one like you. You are great in every way, powerful, kind, merciful, generous. And Lord, as we reflect on this Easter weekend and being here today, thinking of how you planned to redeem a people to yourself, it's amazing that you did not leave us in our sin, though we were your enemies and rebellious in every way, but you sought after us. And the way that you redeemed us, no one would have thought it, that you would save us by dying that you would conquer us, your enemies, with love. Lord, you deserve our adoration, our affection, our devotion. You deserve to be our passion, our zeal. Thank you that we were far, and yet you have brought us near. And Lord, thinking about your plan back in the garden, though it was beautiful and amazing, and put your beauty on display, we cursed it with our sin. And yet now as we read your word, as we celebrate today, we know that you are bringing us back to the garden. You are making all things new, including our very hearts. But Lord, we must confess that we are on a hunt for acceptance. We're on a hunt for love and purpose, and we look for it in anyone and everything we can put our hands on. Thank you that it's exhausting. Thank you that it doesn't work. Thank you that we are looking for more and more. And Lord, I pray that we would see you, we would behold you, we'd be in love with you, that you'd fill us with gratitude so we'd leave this place wanting others to experience your kindness and love for them. Thank you for this resurrection. It's stunning. And Lord, I pray that you would protect our hearts from growing numb to it because if it's real, it changes everything. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if your faith is in Christ, hear the assurance of pardon from Ephesians 2, this great news. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. All right, let's continue to worship through giving. Ushers, you can come forward to collect the offering. You can also uh, give by visiting our uh, website, trinitylakeland.org or our app, you can visit either one of those and also give. All right, please sing along with us. Victory, all praise will rise 
to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Please stand. Let's continue to sing together. The fear that held us now gives away. To him who is our peace, his final breath upon the cross is now alive in me. Your name, your name is victory. Yes. 
You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father Praise the Son That stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame this gospel truth of all shall not kneel and shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty Was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over. Release 
from my chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom me faithfully bore He canceled my debt and he called me his friend oh, When death was arrested in my But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested and my life Confessing our faith together using the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We got four questions and answers uh, today. I'll read the questions and let's answer together. What offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ as our Redeemer executeth the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. How doth Christ execute the office of a prophet? Christ executeth the office of a prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. How does Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ executed the office of a priest in his once suffering but himself sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. All right, one more. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executeth the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Amen. All right, you guys may be seated. We got a couple announcements before we let the kids out. Oh, well. 
If you want to connect and find more uh, about what's going on here at Trinity, you can scan this QR code, and that's the easiest way to reach out to us, and we'll make sure to connect with you. You also notice a lot is going on. Uh, next week, there's a student ministry luncheon. And then there's also a Weekender in two weeks. The Weekender is our new members class or a class if you want to just learn more about who Trinity is. Uh, but this morning, I just want to highlight two announcements. So if you take the insert, one side has this awesome shirt right here, and it's for Campus Outreach. Campus Outreach is taking seven students and four staff members to a college in Guadalajara, Mexico for five weeks. They're going to be studying Spanish as well as evangelizing to students. <clears throat> and so each person, it costs $6,000, and they're almost there. And so this is a way to get a shirt and also support them. And if you want to buy one of the shirts, you can scan this QR code. If you have any questions, you can contact Jackson Airmore. His email is right there. And you have to order them by Saturday. So that's exciting. The other side, you'll see that we are announcing we have a podcast coming called The Compass and Map. <clears throat> The first reason why we have the podcast is we want to make Tim cool and relevant. The second reason why, I mean, just his face right now, guys, it's amazing. Um, but no, th the main purpose was we were just trying to think of an easy way for Tim to provide more teaching to us. And so podcasts are a, a means many of us use every day. Episodes will be 10 to 15 minutes long, and they will come out every Wednesday starting this Wednesday. So if you scan the QR code, you can follow it now. There is a trailer already. And so Tim's just going to be addressing topics related to Trinity and answering different biblical and theological questions as well. So we're really excited about that. through fifth grade are dismissed. The rest of you may stand, greet someone new. There's a lot of new faces here today on Easter. Find someone you've never seen and shake their hand. I challenge you. Will you join me in our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession? Jesus, there is no one like you. You are utterly unique in every way. And so just like those questions just said, you are our prophet, priest, and king. You're our prophet, the word made flesh, speaking to us. You're our priest. You're our representative before God. Though we were far, you have brought us close and near by being our sacrifice. No lamb, no bull but your blood, your body, broken and poured out for us, the guilty, and you're our king. You're establishing and building a kingdom that will never end, that is only going to grow more and more. And it is amazing to consider that you would invite us to be citizens of that kingdom. Lord, if we're honest, in many ways, we have worked really hard to build our own kingdoms. And thankfully, they crumble. Thankfully, they don't work. And so would you align us to your mission? 
your passion, your zeal to love the world and to give them the gospel. There is no better cause to give our life to. And Jesus, as we think about this week, your death on Friday, being in the grave on Saturday and defeating death today, you loved the mission your father sent you on. You loved the chore. And so when we think about that cross, how you were arrested, you were spit upon, mocked, hit, stabbed, tortured, why would we ever have the silly thought that you don't love us? Help us to not be so naive to even consider the possibility you are not for us. You have proven it. Thank you that our our sin does not repel you away, but it is our very sin that brought you here. Thank you, Jesus, that you are committed to a people like us. And I pray that when we leave here, we will be excited that we get to work for you, to serve you, our great king. Holy Spirit, this morning, we want to intercede on behalf of other churches. Thank you that you have filled Lakeland and Polk County with amazing churches. Thank you that these churches are gathering this morning, singing and worshiping you and opening up the scriptures and sermons being preached. We pray for those pastors and leaders that they would be excited. They would consider it a privilege and an honor to care for those in their churches. We pray for the new people that are visiting today that maybe some are, are uh, debating what they believe and considering the claims of the gospel. We pray, Spirit, that you'd give them belief, that they, they would see Jesus and want to trust him and follow him all of their days. And Lord, now as we turn to the preaching of your word, thank you for Tim. Thank you for his love for you. Thank you for his love for your word. Thank you that he thinks about us as he's reading the word. And so, Spirit, we pray that you would uh, work in our hearts to encourage us, to convict us, to bring our gaze upon you so that we would see you, that we'd be in love with you, and that we'd want to leave here to love others like you have loved us. We pray that you would work through Tim. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, my name is Shannon Pierce, and the scripture passage this morning comes from Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. This is God's word. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened, and moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels, who had said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. For he, so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. 
and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? If you're new or visiting Trinity, uh, we want to welcome you, especially with Easter being a holiday where many times it's connections to family or loved ones might pull you into a, a service that you don't normally attend. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, we hope that this is a, a, an experience for you that is encouraging and that hopefully that even makes you, helps you make sense of some things that can be hard to understand. Um, in the particular narrative we're looking at this morning, uh, first, let me remind you, this, we really believe this happened in space and time. These aren't just religious stories. We believe this is actually eyewitness testimony. And that one of the things you'll notice, notice what they embody is the pattern. That you, the pattern in the story is the pattern I think you see all around you and even in our own lives. If you think of yourself as a Christian, it's the pattern you should be able to recognize in your own life. You have ideas. They're suffering. That suffering causes you to question most everything, the ideas you've had, and then you meet him. And then meeting him, you realize you were wrong, and then everything changes. That's, that pattern is not isolated to this story. Uh, that pattern is something that it, I would think is, plays out in the life of every single person who's ever come to faith in Jesus, from the times of Christ all the way through to the last person who will be redeemed. Uh, there's an important pattern. It's important for you to be able to recognize how that works. And because in particular, suffering is ever present. Notice that's what captured them in their conversation. Have you ever thought about how the control, how much uh, events that are sorrowful, events that are hard, capture your imagination and energies and such that that's what you spend a lot of time talking about? You might have good things and you share good things and everybody's happy about that, but if you notice how the prevalent tone of what can carry through your day is, tends to be what's wrong, I mean, we're discipled in that as a society if you look at the American media. I mean, what's breaking news? Something bad has happened. Breaking news means 12 people have been killed, some politicians have been caught in a scandal, something, some you know, big situation has gone down. And notice the tone of what it is every day is wrong, what's wrong, what's, where, where is their suffering? So in that, I think it's a very human trend. And it's a very ancient trend. And you even see it in these two guys. As they're walking, what are they talking about? Jesus died. Now, they have data points that maybe he's, he's not dead anymore, but what, what's the, the tone? We had hoped. And they were sad. So just, we just want to follow that through this narrative you know, for our lesson this morning. If you want to follow along, the, uh, we've provided a worship uh, in your worship folder, an outline for you to, to follow along. We're going to start with that experience of what does it mean to be lost and disillusioned? Because these two guys are wrecked. There's lots of things that help us understand it and see it clearly. They are absolutely devastated over what has now happened. But then, Jesus. So there we're going to call an interception. All you sports fans, who doesn't love a good pick six? All right, this is that. I mean, there's a complete reversal. And it all comes because Jesus intercepts them on their, in the middle of their despair on whatever they were going. And then, then you get to this surprising outcome. That, that what is the whole thing about their burning hearts? What does it mean to be inflamed by a new love? Okay? So let's just walk through the narrative that way and start uh, with the first big idea. What's significant about being disillusioned? Let's start with the people. Okay? So if you look in the, the story preceding this, it's talking about the disciples and the eyewitnesses, the, the women that had gone to attend to Jesus' body, and they are with the disciples. Then that's when you get that very day, two of them. What does them refer to? Is their disciples, their insiders. These are people who are, who are part of the collection of the people that would be known to be disciples. And at that time, we know that there's one reference in the Apostle Paul, he makes a reference to 500 people. So these two are most likely part of that 500. Now there's a bonus. Now you see the name Cleopas. We see later down in, he's referred to when he's talking in verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered Jesus. Now why is he named? 
One of the things that was significant in the books of the, you know, the, the New Testament was when figures were named, it's most likely because they were known to the believing community. In other words, most likely Cleopas was a leader. That means that if, let's say, Luke's gospel was published in 40 A.D., and it's 10 years after these events have happened, well, and he's writing to the collected believers that are there, why would he name Cleopas? It's because most likely the church in Jerusalem knew who he was. Now, this is where it gets really intriguing. There are a few Bible scholars who will go out there and say, go this far as to say, there are some indicators Cleopas could actually be Joseph's brother. That means Cleopas is Jesus' uncle. How much data did he have about all of these events if he's Joseph's brother? If you go all the way back to the angelic visits and the announcement of the virgin birth and the announcement that you have, you know, that you have to leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem for the registration under Caesar, you have the angels appearing to the shepherds. You have the shepherds coming and telling Mary and Joseph what had happened there. You have the visits of the wise men. You have the angelic visit coming to say, leave Bethlehem and flee to Egypt because Herod's going to come and try to kill the baby. And we have an angelic visit in Egypt calling them back to the promised land. If that had happened to Joseph and you don't have TV and you don't have books and you don't have podcasts, even by old guys who are trying to be cool. I mean, if you, if you have nothing but family conversations, what are the odds that Cleopas knew all the stories? High. So if Cleopas is, in other words, he's that deep into the story, and yet he lost heart. Okay, those of you who've grown up in church, you can be in church a long, long time. You can have lots and lots of data points, and you can lose heart. Why do I refer to losing heart? Well, you have verse 17. What is this conversation you're holding with each other as they walk? And they stood there looking sad. They're sad. And then we have in verse 21, we had hoped that he was the one. But he'd been killed. All right, let's look at disillusionment as a word, and then we're going to look, talk about disillusionment as an experience. Look at the word. If you take the word disillusioned and you take it apart, dis is a prefix, and what's the core of the word? Illusion. Now, notice when we use the word disillusion, we usually mean that you've become disappointed by something. You had hoped, and then now your dreams had fallen. You had high expectations, and then everything got ruined. You were going to take the kids to Disney, and then it rained. I mean, you, 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 you dreams, reality. And we use that word disillusion to describe some, some plan or hope or otherwise expectation that now has been wrecked. But notice the meaning of the word. It means actually you were suffering under an illusion and then now you were rudely brought to reality. Because if you were disillusioned, that means you were really buying into something that was an illusion. It was a mirage. It wasn't, you weren't tapped into reality. And now you've been brought into sobering reality by usually what experience? Suffering. Notice their grid. Back into 19, I love it that Jesus engages them with, what things? <laughs> like, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, are you like the only guy on planet Earth that doesn't know what's been going down? Like, dude, where are you from? Where have you been? Under what rock have you been living? How do you not know? And they begin, well, concerning Jesus and mighty deeds and the word of God. And, but then the chief priests and rulers delivered him and condemned to death. We had hoped. But then, yes, but besides all this, it's now the third day. And some women of our company have amazed us. And they were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, and some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it that way, but him they did not see. 
So now just, just a reminder about what's happening in this story in space and time, Cleopas and whoever the unnamed disciple are, if you're new to the Bible or you're new to this whole Christian thing, we really believe Jesus is God. So this is the God of the universe who is standing on a dusty road between Jerusalem and Emmaus and he's talking with two guys who are disappointed that they haven't seen him. Is that suffering under an illusion? I mean, do you see how out of touch with reality? But what has got them blinded? It's the problem of suffering. What they can't calculate is, well, there's, a, there's an author named Carl Truman, and he writes a lot extensively about this idea, is that we're good on a theology of glory. Americans are great at glory. We love winners. We love all the people who succeed. We love the people who make money. We love the people who are pretty. We love all the people who achieve. We do not have a good theology of suffering. And yet, but if God has gotten his most important work done through atoning for our sins, how did God get that work done? Through suffering. All right, so does everybody know what a kaleidoscope is? Remember, it's that little tube, maybe you play with a kid, and, they, and they, you know that the most original ones, they had mirrors and they had gemstones in them. So that when you spin it and, you know, there's all the, the dazzling colors and shapes that you look at and you can look through a kaleidoscope and then you can see amazing senses of color or spectacle. All right. Imagine if you had two of those and you put those up against your, both of your eyes and you're just dazzled all the time by what you see. How much else do you see? Because you have both of your eyes covered by kaleidoscopes. You see nothing. Try to walk, try to work, try to get anything done. You can't see anything because only because this dazzling thing is in front of your eyes. Now contrast that. What if you hold a gemstone, those gemstones that were in the, the, the original lenses of kaleidoscopes, and what if you put those gemstones in your hands? And now you could actually look at them and you can handle them and you could appraise them even and maybe conclude that these rubies or these diamonds are actually worth something. Um, and whatever they are, but now how blind are you? You're not. I would say that contrast represents our problem with the, with the relationship with suffering. If you experience suffering and all you see is suffering, then what you do, you even interpret God through the lens of suffering. And everything else in your life is you're blinded to it because all you can see is suffering. Compared with, if you see suffering in its proper perspective, it's real. And like gemstones that we know by geology are formed under immense pressure. And you could actually appraise those gemstones and look at them for what they are like in your life, that your experiences of suffering have profound, almost in, un, inexpressible value because of what you've suffered and what you've learned of God in it. That would be the contrast between disillusioned versus being open-eyed. But right now, our two men are disillusioned. They can't even see God standing right in front of them. All they can see is the suffering, the loss, the disappointment, the sadness. That's all they can see. I'm not making fun of them. I'm describing them. What I would say is, can we see ourselves in them? That there is something about the power of suffering that can be so powerful, it's all we see. And we literally don't see anything else. In that situation, what happens? Second big idea, intercepted. What if Jesus shows up? I mean, what if? What if the God who made them, the God who had been present with them in all of their suffering, the God who had gone through this suffering precisely to save their souls, was now intercepting into all of their disillusionment? So again, we got to go back. I know a lot of you know what an interception is. Some of you might not. If the word pick six, if you've never heard that before, comes from this experience. A team has the football. They are moving the football, probably even progressing down toward where their destination, they would like to score. But if the def one of the defenders snags the ball, 
between the throw of the quarterback to his intended receiver, there's a defender who jumps in the way, grabs the ball, and now runs the length of the field in the other direction, and he scores. You have a pick, and because he scores, the touchdown without the extra point is six points, so you have a pick six. Whatever that is, it is a profound surprise, and it's a complete reversal of fortunes. The team that thought they had a chance to score is now down an, a, down an additional touchdown. Because the team that was not expected to have the ball got the ball. And now what changed? The entire momentum. Here, Cleopas and the unnamed disciple are in the throes of despair. They are sad. They had hoped. But notice that language of past tense, it implies they had hoped, but they weren't hoping anymore. And in that situation, Jesus shows up. Now let's note some options. Option number one, Jesus could have not, obviously not appeared to them. That was certainly an option. What, for whatever reason, and we don't know, we are told about Jesus appearing to these two particular disciples in addition to all his other several appearances he made. But notice in this one, he could have not done it. I mean, if he's the God of the universe, how much powerful does he have? All power. What is he free to do? Whatever he wants. So he could have not appeared to them. That's one option. Option two, he could have appeared to them like my seventh grade basketball coach. Coach Die. My seventh grade basketball coach had the most, my distinguished, in my life, as being the distinguished title of worst coach I ever had. Why was he the worst? Because contrasted with my favorite coach, Coach Jones, who coached me in baseball from age six all the way through age 18, Coach Jones had the ability, no matter how bad things were, he could calm you down. It didn't matter. A strikeout, a blown play, it didn't matter. However rattled, upset, trailing by 10 runs, it didn't matter. Coach Jones could calm you down. Coach Die, it did not matter how good you were doing, he could unsettle you. And he had a hair temper, I mean, hair trigger temper. He could get in your face and he would yell. So if Coach Die was here, he would have been six inches within Cleopas's nose, screaming at him, red in the face. And he goes, how could you lose hope? What were you thinking? How could you? Why didn't you? I mean, it could be so, it could be so different. But do you notice that's not what Jesus does? I mean, one of the most profound moves is his move first to let them tell the story. They are walking, going back to the beginning, while they were talking, verse 15, discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said, by the way, can you understand now why, why it's possible they were kept from recognizing him? Because all they see is suffering. But they don't recognize him, but he says, what is this conversation? You're holding with each other as you walk. Now, remember, the distance is about seven miles. So if you've ever done Lake Hollingsworth in an hour or short 45 minutes, so imagine you got about a two-hour walk. You can talk about a lot of stuff in two hours. What is this conversation you're having? Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know? And he just says, what things? Parents, a profound strategy with your children. What, what, what's going on? You tell me. In premarital counseling, which I've only done about 150 times, I will get couples to tell me the gospel. When I start, one of the first conversations I'll have, many of you are knowing, you're smiling, you've been there, you know the torture, but why do I do that? Why do I get you to tell me the story? Because when you tell the story of the gospel, you find that you really know more than you think you know. But every now and then there's some gaps, there's some missing pieces, and I might have to nudge a little or fill in a little, but notice what's the value that if you tell the story, because you really see what you really do think and know. When you as parents ask your kids, you, hey kid, kid, kid of mine, you tell me the story. What happened? And Jesus is doing that with these two disciples. As disciples, they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus a lot. And he's like, hey, guys, what, what are you thinking? What do you know? What do you tell me? And they are totally, totally disrupted by the suffering. Just 
even though he had repeatedly told him, it's necessary. It, the Son of Man must be crucified. He must be rejected. And he must be raised from the dead. He had told them repeatedly. Remember, that's one of the reasons Peter tries to take Jesus aside to rebuke him, because Peter's like, no, 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 none of this suffering talk. And Jesus has to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You have in mind the things of men. You do not have in mind the things of God. So if suffering is such a big deal, notice why it's so significant that Jesus would intercept us in it. Now, be clear. Jesus doesn't scream like Coach Die and get red in the face and get within six inches of his nose, but he does expose them. And he would expose us too. So in verse 25... Notice he does say, oh, foolish ones, and how slow of heart to believe. Foolish, it literally comes from the Greek word that literally means mindless, like you've lost your minds. Oh, foolish ones. He's, there's Cleopas, whoever, let's call the other one Billy. F Cleopas, Billy, you've lost your minds. He's not, he's not cruel. He's not humiliating, but he's direct. And then the word, how slow of heart, is literally the word for dull. Now, we can think dull like as a sound or an auditory, but think visually. How many of you have dimmer lights on your dining rooms or someplace in your family room? You've seen a dimmer switch, and you can dial it up to maximum brightness, but you can also dial it down to where it looks like it's barely on. That would be the word dull where it's just barely, barely flickering and there's barely any light coming out of the fixture. That would be the meaning of the word dull. Keep that in mind. It's going to come back in play in just a couple minutes. Because notice what he says, what you are, where you are, you've lost your minds and you're dull. But then notice he says this pattern has been there all through the scriptures. Verse 20, verses 26 and following. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All right, now there's a lot in those two verses. Okay, first off, was it not necessary? If you've been around here for any length of time, you know, even as we've been looking at the Old Testament and First and Second Samuel, in the Old Testament, we were always seeing Jesus. Because notice one of the things we had really believed like from the very beginning, like even in the Garden of Eden, remember when they are expelled from the garden and then they tried to cover themselves with, with the leaves of plants, but then God clothes them with the skin of the animals. What did we try to help you recognize? You know, in the third chapter of the whole Bible, there already is a little imprint that the guilty are going to be covered by the suffering of an innocent substitute. By Genesis 12, by Genesis 15, by Genesis 22, you start to see the images of the pattern of the guilty get covered when an innocent substitute suffers. There's going to be suffering. The whole sacrificial system from Exodus all the way through to the building of the temple was always exemplifying every day and every petitioner who would come to the tent of meeting that there would be a suffering in order for there to be an entrance. There would have to be the death of an atoning sacrifice for the, the penitent believer to be forgiven and to be admitted close to God. The pattern was everywhere. It was on every page. It was in every book. And Jesus, does now, now, and second thing, again, if you're new to this or you're questioning whether or not you would believe in Jesus, can I point out something vivid about what he says? He says, beginning in Moses through all the prophets, it's about him. Not about an idea, uh, about a person. Not about cognitive systems, about a person. And more radically, if you want to think of Jesus as a philosopher, you want to think about him as a teacher, he claims stuff that's too big. C.S. Lewis pointed this out back in 1950s. C.S. Lewis pointed out that if you want to have Jesus be a great teacher, you have a problem with Jesus' own teaching because Jesus claims too much. What kind of teacher says all of God's word is about me? An egomaniac or somebody who's horribly warped and twisted in their psychology, they're delusional, or it's God himself. But that, that means Jesus can't be a teacher because he claims too much. 
But if we really believe he really is God, and this, these, all of these pages and all of the, of the stories from Moses all the way through are really about him, well, then that means it was God himself who came to suffer that people like you and I could be redeemed. Our salvation has not been offered like a puzzle for us to put together, so it's sort of offered, but you complete it. No, what it really means is Jesus declared it is finished at his suffering death. God himself has done something that people like you and I can be redeemed. I mean, these claims are enormous. And they go, run, they run right through that issue of suffering. They think one way, pick six. Go in the opposite direction, boys, because you think this way, but no, it's really that way. And you think it has, it's suffering gums up the machinery, and he's like, no, no, I'm telling you, it's precisely through suffering that I was getting the best work done. Now, is your suffering, the, are, is it these lenses through which you look at everything, or now are they gemstones? And you can look at suffering in the pr appropriate proportion and with the right perspective of seeing it through Christ. And the suffering is real in a fallen world, but it's temporary. And suffering is powerful, but it's not more powerful than him. He is, he is the resurrected one who has been through the worst suffering, and he has come back out of it, healed and glorified. When have you been redirected? When did somebody intervene in your despair or your places of being blocked and it changed everything? When were you stuck by yourself and it took somebody else coming into it with you to get you out of it and to help you see it appropriately through the lens of Jesus? Because notice that's what he does. So, we have disillusionment, we have ideas, we have suffering, we have the interception. We have Jesus showing up, and then what changes? Third big idea. How are hearts changed when God's word suddenly now makes sense? How comfortable are you with the words, I was wrong? How comfortable are you with the words, I was wrong? I, I would suggest that's a huge test on your spiritual maturity. They think they despair. They think they see suffering, they despair. Jesus intercepts. Were they wrong? Do they come to see it? Are their eyes opened? I mean, think about this process of what begins to change. So again, back when Jesus says, how foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary? It's funny, you wanna know the key words in those two verses? Here are the key words, believe, prophets, necessary, Christ, suffer, glory. Believe, the prophets necessary Christ suffer glory look at the progression everything that had been anticipated and foretold in the prophets everything that had been mapped out and told to all of God's people ahead of time and who saw it coming and then Jesus God man Messiah suffering but then glorified achieving glory for us and glorified in his own victory over sin and death and satan and hell and then saying that victory is now your victory if you trust in me what does he do with these disciples i mean i just love it as he explains the necessities but then things change so they drove near the village we're now in verse 28 where they were going, he acted as if he was going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it's toward evening and the day is now far, far spent, implying it's not safe out there. That's basically what they're implying. It's, it's after dark, it's on the road, it's on the highway. It, it may not be safe out there, come in and stay with us. But also they were, they clearly, they acknowledged they were enjoying the conversation. 
They urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. What's significant about that? Here's what's turned. They invited him to stay. He's behaving like he's the host. That's the language of what the host of a meal would do. Now, who asked whom to dinner? They asked him to stay with them, and then he starts acting like he's in charge. Now, another thing you got to add, how many times had they seen him do that? Remember back earlier in Luke's gospel, back in Luke 15, why was Jesus in trouble? Why were the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees mad at him? Because he kept hosting sinners. What did it mean to host? He would behave like this. He would lead the dinner. There was a Jewish protocol for how you would have a dinner and how you would begin it. And Jesus is doing those things. He's doing, he's, in other words, as the host, he's like, I take care of you. I'm feeding you. I'm meeting your needs. It is my privilege and my joy to host you. How many times have they seen Jesus do it? Now, there's a bunch of things we're not told. We don't know. But all we have is this next phrase. Their eyes were open and they recognized him. Was it a mannerism? Was it something in the way he did, the way he had the same mannerism when he broke the bread every time? Did they see his scars? Because we know his scars are visible when he goes back and he sees Thomas and all the other disciples. What what did they see? I don't know. But there was something they saw, and they were suddenly their eyes were opened. Now here's an important grammar point. All right, you gotta catch this. In verse 31, when it says their eyes were opened, that means that's passive. Why does that matter? That means they were not the persons acting on their eyes. Okay, basic grammar in your kitchen. If your three-year-old asks for apple juice, do you say, go ahead, lift the jug, open it, pour it for yourself? You probably don't do that with your three-year-old, right? Why? Jug too big, way too heavy. If they can't open the jug, how much is going to get spilled all over the kitchen floor? No, what if... If you open the apple juice, you are acting upon the jar to open it, right? What does it mean if it was opened? It means somebody other than the apple jar did it. Their eyes were opened. What is that implying? It implies back to the interception. God's taking action. This is an example of what we believe is sovereign grace. God moves first. God takes action to give you eyes to see. And notice they will repeat it in verse 32. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures? Now, you might think from this that what we need is the body of Jesus personally present with us for us to be able to rightly understand the scriptures. And what I would remind you is, no, 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 no. The same power that was working through Jesus incarnate is the same power that is now at work with us as he himself said would happen. And what do I mean by that? I mean the power of his spirit. What power was working in Jesus bodily while he was in front of Cleopas and Billy? The Holy Spirit. And when Jesus said, and it's good, it's to your advantage that I go away, because then I will pour out my spirit upon you, and he will bring to your remembrance everything that I've said, and he will open to you the scriptures. What, notice what we've moved from. Notice what we've moved from. We've moved from ideas. When you talk about an idea, you can very much remain in charge. You can talk about philosophy, you can talk about a philosophical point of view, you can talk about communism, you can talk about capitalism, you can talk about ideas, and you very much remain the person in charge of those ideas, like little pieces of puzzle that you move around in your brain. But when you move to a person, now you're interacting with somebody who can ask you questions back. You can ask him questions and he can ask you very uncomfortable questions. 
Because now it's not the same thing as working with an idea. Because working with an idea, you very much know something like you are the manager of the little pieces of air traffic moving around the board of your head. But when you interact with another human, when you interact with another person, they have as much agency in the conversation as you do. And what happens if that person is the God that made you? Can he move also? Can he ask also? Can he act? And what we have him doing here is he's open. What, what is the problem? They're blind. They can't see. And what if suddenly now he's like, look, take those things off of your eyes and look at it in a different light. Let me open to you the scriptures and let me see, help you now see suffering in its right perspective. And when you see it in its right perspective, now that he himself has gone through it to end it, he's gone through suffering to, to provide for the ultimate end of all suffering because he's going to atone for our sin and conquer it by his resurrection. Was it not necessary? And now, glory. And their eyes are opened. Now, what in the heck happens with him vanishing? I have no idea. He vanished. He, he walks through walls in other situations when he meets the apostles. The doors are closed and locked, and suddenly Jesus is there in their midst. I have no idea what he's doing except he's God, and he's glorified in his resurrection body. But he vanishes. But now, you know what's so funny Remember, they're urging him to come in. Why are they urging him to come in? Because it's after hours now. And what immediately happens after this? We didn't print this for you. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. It's like everything has changed now. It's like, well, maybe it's not safe out there. Well, I don't care. Jesus is here. Have you ever, can you think of a place where you've ever been so happy to be wrong? Can you think of a place where you learn, you're, you're, you become so happy you had been wrong? It usually involves love. Now, I know all you men have read Pride and Prejudice, so I know some of the ladies won't know that what we're talking about here, but in the story of Pride and Prejudice, you have the key two players are Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet. And so all you men, you know this story. So as we try to catch up other people in the room on what really happened, remember it basically this way. They meet, there possibly are sparks, but there also there's prickles and it's awkward. And then they, the, it's like, it's the, it's the basic storyline of every Hallmark movie Tim Strawbridge has ever watched. Okay, <laughs> two people meet and they like each other kind of, but there's too much of an ick factor and something's wrong in the way he talks and the way she acts and something, it's something's not right, but then time and exposure and time and exposure, what happens? And Mr. Darcy, who Elizabeth is absolutely convinced is pompous and, and, and proud and prejudice, hence pride and prejudice for the title. And Elizabeth, I mean, he actually gets to the place about two thirds in the story where he proposes. And she so verbally slaps him about the head and shoulders so severely in a proposal that it's like his spirit is crushed. And Mr. Darcy has come to see she is the, he, he, he is crestfallen, but he doesn't give up because he still loves her. But then he does some of the most amazing heroic things of generosity and, and humility because he hides things. He hides beautiful things and he does things to bail her family out of some tragic situations. And she has no clue and she just dog cusses him everywhere she goes because he is Mr. Darcy. Ugh. But then she comes to find the, out the truth. And when she does... He reapproaches, and he just asks her simply, he said, if, if your feelings have not changed from last April, tell, tell me now, and you silence me with one word, and I will leave you. I will not bother you anymore. But from your conversation with my aunt, I had some sense or cause for hope. Have your feelings changed? If you don't want to read the book, Go watch the 2005 movie version with Keira Knightley and Matthew McFadden. Unbelievable. It's so good. You go figure out what happens in the movie. But let's just say this. She understands she had been wrong. 
And when she understands, when Elizabeth sees she was wrong, talking with her own father, she says, Father, I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong about him. I was wrong about everything. Is she grief stricken? No, her heart's on fire. Do you know what's really cool literarily? If you go into Greek language, the word for dull is the antonym for the word burning. What did Jesus say they were? You're dull. They're racked by suffering, they're disillusioned, but then Jesus intercepts them. And then what happens? Were not our hearts burning while he opened to us the scriptures? They've gone from the dimmest lights to the brightest. And what made the difference? They met the living Christ, and they came to understand they had been wrong. I don't know where you are with Jesus today. If you believe in him, this is the kind of thing that makes your heart burn still. But if you've had questions, or maybe you've ever considered, could, is it possible you could consider, have you been wrong about him? And if you could consider that, then maybe this could be the day that changes your entire eternity. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are the kind of God who works this way and that as you would work, that the eyes of our hearts could be opened and enlightened. That we may know what is the hope to which you've called us and what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and what are the immeasurable, what's the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us who believe according to the working of your great might that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and that you've seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places. Thank you, Father, that you could work such a way with us to open our eyes, to open to us your word, and to see now the lens that, that makes sense of suffering, yours and ours, because of what you've done to atone for us, Lord Jesus, through your death, but then what you've conquered by your resurrection. Thank you. And that you are powerful to save and that you're loving and kind to intercept people like us. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, every last Sunday, we collect a second offering, and you can give to that offering uh, the same way that you give to our regular offering. You can visit our website or download our apps uh, and give to this uh, Mercy Fund offering. The Deacons use the Mercy Fund offering to supplement their Mercy Fund, and they use the Mercy Fund to help individuals and families in need. Uh, we also give to about 10 Mercy Ministries that are doing good work around our city um, to help them do what they do, and we use this Sunday to give you a little update on one of those Mercy Ministries, so check out the screen above. Once a month, we take up a special offering specifically for Mercy. 100% of the offering goes to local Mercy Ministries in our community and families and individuals in need. Here is one of the many ministries supported when you give. Greetings, Trinity Presbyterian Church. Uh, for the past nearly 40 years, volunteers in service to the elderly have served the needs of seniors in our local community to help them remain safe and independent in their own homes. The events of the past few years have really put that challenge to the test. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to share with you today a little bit of update of what's gone on with VISTI and to thank you personally for your continuing support and your prayerful uh, contributions to allow us to continue to serve those in need. The past few years has changed the lives of all of us in dramatic ways. That's been particularly true for those that are advanced age that were the most vulnerable and at risk of the impacts of COVID-19. Early in 2020, we started receiving phone calls from those that were fearful that they would lose their transportation to their dialysis appointments or chemotherapy or other medical related appointments. People started calling asking would they still be able to access food for supplemental groceries or hot meals. The fear in their voice was palpable and the joy and the relief that they felt when we told them that Visti was here and would continue to be here for them throughout, you could hear the tears of joy. We could only make that promise because of your continued support and God's grace. And frankly, at the time, we weren't sure how to fulfill that promise. 
We didn't know what we were getting into as a volunteer-driven organization that suddenly many of our volunteers were at risk themselves. And it's only been through God's mercy and grace that we can sit here today and thank you that we've been able to provide uninterrupted services to seniors in need in our community throughout this pandemic. Right now, our biggest needs are for volunteer drivers to help continue to deliver groceries and hot meals either once a month or every Tuesday and Thursday mornings. That's the area where we are in most need of immediate help. We also have upcoming events like Thanksgiving meals to be delivered or personal care boxes in December and again in June. There are many ways that people can get involved if you wish to do so. Simply come visit our website at visti.org. You can register online. You can see all the other events and activities available for you and your family to get more directly involved. I often think of, well, one of the many analogies that Pastor Tim shares with us over the years, the one about the tube of toothpaste, that when it's put under pressure, what comes out is really what was always inside. Trinity Presbyterian Church was put under pressure these last few years, and what has come out has been generosity and mercy and grace and a response from the heart to continue to support those most at need in our community. On behalf of the more than 4,000 seniors we continue to serve, thank you so much and God bless every one of you. All right, please stand. Let's sing one more together.
Now, if your faith is in Christ, remember, he is not illusioned. He sees you exactly as he sees his son because of what he's done through his suffering and his resurrection. If your faith is in Christ, that's why these words can now apply to you. Take him at his word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his peace and happy Easter.